Good evening all and welcome. Tonight, I have a very creepy collection of middle of nowhere stories. So buckle up, because it's time to get uncomfortable and let the darkness take control. I'm an attorney living in the United States. This experience took place between my undergraduate and law school years. After graduating college, two of my friends and I decided to take a road trip to celebrate our achievement and spend some time together before going our separate ways, as we all had different post-graduation plans. Having been longtime fans of horror and the supernatural, we agreed to visit a few haunted locations along our trip. Most of the journey was rather carefree. We enjoyed a few national parks, as well as stopping at numerous supposedly haunted or otherwise creepy areas. My friends, Percy and Victor, were great company. But other than visiting a few spooky locations, nothing truly paranormal occurred along our trip. We had used a few websites and blogs to pick locations near our route. After a week or so of travel, I was looking up the next few locations at a hotel on my laptop when I came across a rather interesting looking site. I happened upon a short newspaper article from the late 1800s that involved a family living at a remote farmhouse in the backward area of the state that we were traveling through. The report noted that the secluded farmhouse had been inhabited by a rather reclusive family that kept to themselves. The local townspeople seldom saw the family members, but the oldest son reportedly would travel to the nearby town to purchase grain at the general store about once a month. During the winter of the article's publication, about two months passed without a visit from the boy. The local shop owner grew concerned that perhaps the family had been stricken with illness. After voicing his concerns to the sheriff, a group of men was organized to bring supplies to the family. That winter had been particularly harsh, and the townspeople wanted to make sure the family had enough grain to last. The supplies were gathered, and a group of three individuals, including the sheriff, set off to visit the farmhouse in the woods. The farm consisted of a small barn and a two-story wooden house. Upon their arrival at the homestead, the men were unable to rouse the family. The barn was empty, and no one received an answer when the men knocked at the house's door. Growing more concerned, the sheriff walked around the back of the house and noticed that the back door was ajar. Calling to his companions, the sheriff entered through the back door, announcing his presence as he did so. What met the three men upon entering the house was described in the newspaper articles as the most gruesome of scenes. Entrails lined the entirety of the small two-room home. Body parts were strewn around the floor, and the furniture and tables were in disarray, covered in blood. Bloody handprints lined up the walls, up the stairwell. The second floor was similarly gruesome, with the heads of all four family members found arranged neatly along the edge of the windowsill. The local coroner was brought to the scene and determined that the family had been mutilated by some form of animal. Of the few body parts that remained intact, claw marks could be seen, apparently leading to the conclusion that it was indeed an animal attack. The location of the heads was written off as a coincidence, and the article noted that no further investigations were made into their deaths. The house was boarded up and subsequently abandoned. In the years following the massacre, the town fell on hard times. My research revealed that the last few members of the town had packed up and moved on a few years after the incident, with the entire town later being demolished and converted into a logging company, which was abandoned 30 years or so after. However, the small patch of woods, a 
about four square miles in which the farmhouse was located, remains untouched. Outside of a few chat boards mentioning that the house was still there and had been the site of another amateur ghost hunting expedition, I could find no further information on either the family or the massacre. I know it's a little gruesome, but it was exactly the kind of place Percy, Victor, and I were looking for. Showing my friends the article and the information, they agreed that we should make the three and one half hour detour through the backwoods to find this house. One of the chat boards I had read noted that the patch of woods housing the farm lay at the intersection of two dirt roads that had been used by the logging company. If you parked at the corner of the woods along this intersection and headed southeast, you would eventually find the farmhouse. We decided to head there the following night, wanting to make the experience as creepy as possible. In retrospect, this was a mistake. Hindsight's 20 20ths. The following evening, we packed up our gear and bundled up as it was mid-November, and the temperature was supposed to be below freezing. We each had high-powered LED flashlights with three spare sets of batteries, one for each of us, and a compass. We ate some dinner, filled up the car and an extra gas can, as there were no operating gas stations in the area, and we didn't want to be stranded in the middle of nowhere with no cell service. Setting off, we were incredibly excited to trudge around the woods and scare ourselves. The drive was easy enough, and after a few wrong turns, we found the dirt path we were supposed to take off of the highway. Supposedly, we would take this dirt road for about an hour and a half, and it would lead us to the area we were heading. It being my car, I was driving, not trusting either of my friends with my car on this rather sketchy path. After 20 minutes or so of driving, both Percy and Victor had begun to doze off. When we were about 15 minutes away from the location, I turned to shake Percy awake as he was sitting in the passenger seat, and I wanted to make sure I wouldn't miss the intersection. I shook my friend and told him to wake up, taking my eyes off the road for a split second. Turning my gaze back, Percy groaned in the glare of the headlights. Not 10 feet in front of the car was a large dog-like figure. I say dog-like because in the brief glimpse I got, it didn't look quite right. The fur was patchy and its legs were facing backward as if they had been broken and not properly reformed. There was no time to swerve out of the way, and I slammed on my brakes. Sure as hell, I was about to smash into this deformed animal, but there was no sound or impact. Percy yelled, and the car grinded to a halt. Victor, who had been sprawled out in the back seat, was thrown forward and woke up in a panic. I think I hit a coyote or something. It just appeared out of nowhere, I shouted. What do you mean you hit it? Victor asked. I don't know, dude. It was right in front of me, and there's no way it made it out of there, but I didn't feel anything. Yeah, you definitely had to have hit it. It was right there, Percy interjected. We all got out of the car, and Percy walked to the front, while Victor and I went to the back to look for the animal. There's no damage. I don't think you hit it, he yelled. I know I hit it. There was no way it got out in time, I thought to myself. I told him so, and Victor called back. He got out his flashlight and flicked it on. There was no blood and no animal. We walked around a hundred yards and couldn't find a thing. That was very odd. I knew I saw something but I convinced myself it must have been the glare. I pushed the gas and started down the road. Percy threw on some horror movie theme music to set the mood for our adventure. 
and we quickly forgot about the animal on the road as our excitement returned. Before long, Percy called out that he thought he saw the intersection coming off at the edge of the tree line. Sure enough, there was a small dirt pathway cutting through the forest off to our right. We pulled off the side of the roadway and parked the car, flipping the headlights off. I took the keys out of the ignition and turned to my friends. We made it. Let's go find some ghosts. Flipping my flashlight under my face to illuminate my features as I said that, Victor laughed and grabbed his flashlight and extra batteries, shoving them in his backpack. Percy flipped his light on and off to check the batteries and said he was ready. Locking the car and tossing the keys to Victor to put in his bag, I reminded Percy that we should be heading southwest and off we went. Percy leading the way with me and Victor right behind. The forest was pretty dense with a lot of fallen or rotting trees. It was winter so there weren't many animals out, and it was eerily quiet. We were moving at a pretty leisurely pace through the trees, stepping over the fallen limbs and stumps. The woods felt so unfamiliar, and every time one of us looked back, it felt like there were more fallen trees than we had just passed through. After about half an hour of walking, we came to a small clearing filled with white flowers. I walked ahead to catch Percy, and we checked the compass again to make sure we were still heading southeast. Percy showed me the compass, and we indeed were. Victor then called up to us. He had trailed behind and was smacking his flashlight against his palm. What's the holdup? I inquired. He told me his flashlight was dying. We asked if he had not just put new batteries in. He did. That was the weird part. Percy, making our way back to the car and discussing how strange the evening had been, we were eager to leave this creepy place behind. As we approached the car, we noticed something odd. The car's headlights were on, casting an eerie glow in the darkness. We hadn't left them on, and Victor swore he had turned them off when we parked. This sent a shiver down our spines, but we brushed it off as a possible electrical glitch. Opening the car door, we were greeted by another surprise. Percy was not in the car. We assumed he had decided to walk back to the car ahead of us, but now there was no sign of him. We called out his name repeatedly, but there was no response. Panic started to set in. Victor and I decided to search for Percy in the immediate area, thinking he might have gotten lost or was playing a prank on us. We walked around with our flashlights, calling his name, but there was still no sign of him. Feeling increasingly worried, we decided to head back to the house to see if he had returned there. As we approached the farmhouse, the front door was now wide open and the interior was eerily illuminated by our car's headlights. We cautiously entered the house, our hearts pounding in our chests. The house felt different now, and a strange sense of foreboding hung in the air. The graffiti on the walls seemed more ominous, and the shattered window looked like a portal into darkness. We called out for Percy again, our voices trembling. Suddenly, we heard a distant, faint scream coming from upstairs. It was Percy's voice. Panic surged through us, and we rushed to the stairwell. As we climbed the stairs, we could hear Percy's screams growing louder. When we reached the second floor, we found the room that had been empty earlier was now filled with bizarre and disturbing scenes. The walls were covered in more graffiti, but this time it looked fresh sinister. Percy was in the corner of the room, huddled and trembling. His flashlight dropped on the floor. He was muttering incoherently, his eyes wide with terror. We tried to calm him down and get him to explain what had happened, but 
all he could say was that he had seen something in the darkness. As we looked around, we noticed strange symbols drawn on the floor in what appeared to be blood. The symbols seemed to form a pattern that we couldn't quite understand. It was clear that something unnatural had occurred in this room. We decided to get out of the house immediately. Percy was in no condition to explore any further. And we didn't want to stay a moment longer in this nightmarish place. We hurried back to the car, leaving the farmhouse and its mysteries behind. As we drove away from that accursed location, we couldn't help but feel that we had stumbled upon something far more sinister than we had ever anticipated. The events of that night would haunt us for a long time, and we were left with unanswered questions about the farmhouse, the symbols, and what had happened to Percy during his brief disappearance. Our adventure had taken a dark, and unexpected turn, and we couldn't shake the feeling that we had ventured into a realm of horror beyond our comprehension. Floor in a collective state of shock and exhaustion. None of us slept that night. We couldn't shake the fear of what we had encountered in those woods. The unnerving laughter, the pursuit, and those glowing red eyes. We spent the night in uneasy silence, each lost in our thoughts, trying to make sense of the inexplicable events. As the first light of dawn crept into our room, we finally mustered the courage to talk about what had happened. Percy was the first to speak, his voice quivering as he recounted how he had wandered into the woods, believing he was alone and then suddenly found himself back at the car, chased by something he couldn't explain. Victor and I shared our experiences as well, describing the eerie laughter and the terrifying pursuit through the forest. We couldn't come up with any logical explanation for what we had encountered, and the events of the previous night remained a haunting mystery we decided to cut our trip short and head back home immediately. We packed our belongings in a hurry, not wanting to spend another moment in that town or near those woods. The drive back was somber and we hardly spoke a word. The memory of that night weighed heavily on our minds and we couldn't escape the feeling that we had narrowly escaped something malevolent. To this day, we have never been able to explain what happened in those woods, and we have no desire to return there. It was a nightmarish experience that still haunts our thoughts. A reminder that there are places in this world where the line between the natural and the supernatural blurs, and where the darkness holds secrets that are best left undiscovered. None of us spoke about what happened that night. We finished our road trip, only visiting a few tourist locations and sightseeing in a few major cities, and never planned to return. But every now and again, I have dreams where I'm chased by a creature, and I'm always running through the woods. It always ends the same way, with me turning back and seeing those two glowing red eyes for what I hope will be the last time. I purchased a hunting property in Southern Maryland a few years ago. It's a decent chunk of land, over 400 acres, almost entirely wooded. Its history goes back to the 1660s when it was deeded to some English military kel. It has an old plantation style house built in the 1870s. We were told the original house had burned down there's a family cemetery with gravestones that go back to the 1780s and a lot of overgrown boxwood bushes. The place did seem a little creepy right off the bat, but I've always been a pragmatic kind of person. I didn't give that stuff a second thought. The land had been leased by a hunting club for the past 20 years or so. All the stands were set up, 
and the trails already established. It was a perfect fit for us. At one point, I made an offhand joke to the hunting club guy about the haunted house. It really does look like one. He said something along the lines of, Yeah, this place will make your hair stand up on end sometimes. He seemed surprisingly serious. I thought he was going to make a joke back about it. But again, I didn't think much of it. But it stuck out in my mind. The house was unlivable at the time of purchase. So we were commuting back and forth from a friend's house any time we needed to be down there to get the work done. I had never been there at night. By the time deer season came around, me and four other guys went for the opening day of rifle season. We had to get to our stands pretty early when it was still dark. We each went alone to a different stand in a different area. First light was usually around 6.15 so we got there around 5.15. It was about a 15 minute hike through the woods and on opening day, no issues, nothing weird happened. It was a kind of a slow morning, saw a few deer, but nothing worth taking. The second day had the same schedule. I got there at 5.15 and started my hike out. Part of this hike is a long and straight logging path. Once I got on this logging path, I started to get the sense that something was watching me. The feeling came out of nowhere. I've hunted since I was a kid, and I've had deer snort and stomp at me in the dark. I know the wildlife is always watching, but this felt very different. I shined the flashlight through the trees in all directions and didn't see anything. I chalked it up to being paranoid because of what the hunting club guy said. It was an intense feeling. I got to my stand, which is what we call the ladder stand. It's basically a ladder going up a tree with a seat at the top. I got situated and was looking down at my phone since it was still dark. Out of the top of my vision, I saw a bright light. I looked up real quick, and it was a bluish white glow that lasted about two seconds. Somewhere around, 150 to 200 yards out straight ahead. My adrenaline was pumping like crazy. I thought to myself, what the heck was that? The next closest hunter was probably close to 500 yards away, but to my left, there's no way I could have ever seen his light through the trees. I kept my stare at that same spot for what felt like forever, but never saw it again. I ended up trying to justify it in my head as either just seeing stars or maybe a hallucination of some sort. At around 9 or 10 a.m., I got down and walked in that general direction to see if I could see anything really quick, but there was nothing. We're on private land and there's no one else out here. Two guys got deer that morning. I did not. I decided not to mention the light to anyone it was probably just in my head anyway. On the third day, we switched up who went to which stand, since the two guys who got a deer weren't there. One of the guys did end up going to the stand I was at, John. The day went on as normal, but it was another bummer. None of us saw anything worth taking. John didn't mention anything out of the ordinary. And by that point, I had started to forget about the light and didn't care anymore. Day four was our last day, and it was another normal day. But thankfully, I had finally gotten my deer, a small seven point, but I was still happy. John ended up taking a spike, a small buck for the meat. The other guy decided not to take anything, and we went our separate ways. A few weeks later, I decided to put up some trail cams sent out a text to the group with a joke about maybe catching the old colonel wandering around. That's when I got a call from John, and he told me he forgot to tell me. That made my heart drop. I said, dude, you're not going to believe this, but I saw the same thing. I asked him which color and in which direction he saw it. 
He said it was like a bright blue or white, straight out, and it was quick, on and off. He couldn't say exactly. At that point, I thought for sure that the place was haunted, but I had to go out there. I immediately drove down and scouted the area in front of that stand. After about 15 minutes of walking around in the vicinity of where I thought that light was, I found an old ladder stand. It looked like it had been there a long time, maybe 10 years, and it could still be used, but it wasn't safe. We had a poacher on the property. I called the game warden, but she said unless I caught the guy, there was nothing they could do. She just told me to take the old stand down, which I did. I set up the cameras and never saw anyone. I wish I had told John about the light. I still feel like an ass. It was an incredibly dangerous situation for both of us, but thankfully, nothing bad happened. Two to three years have since passed, and I haven't had any issues. I've done a lot of walking, looking for old stands, and actually have found a few more to take down. I tell everyone now who hunts here with me to tell me if they see anything out of the ordinary. About two years ago, in the dead of winter, my power went out. This was a big problem for me because I have a pet leopard gecko who requires heating elements to survive. It started getting very cold in my apartment very quickly to the point I became worried about my pet's safety. I did the only thing I could think of, which was to take my gecko to my car and crank the heater up. Normally, we get a few power outages every winter in my area, and they last maybe an hour or two. This time was different because the power didn't come back on for six hours. After an hour of sitting in my driveway, I got extremely bored and started driving around my neighborhood, which had some more rural areas that butted up against the national forest. One of those areas is an absolutely beautiful overlook where you can see miles of forest and also a few street lights. So I'd be able to see if the power came back on. I drove there and parked to enjoy the view. I had the heat running for a while and the car had gotten a bit hot. So I rolled down the window to let some cool air in. Almost immediately, I started hearing something far off, kind of weird, and a sad sounding howl mixed with a squawk. I assumed it was an animal, but rolled up the window almost all the way just in case. Over the next 20 minutes, the sound got progressively closer and closer to the car until it sounded like it was almost circling me. I can still hear this sound in my mind, clear as day, even though this happened several years ago. I know the animals we had locally and what they sounded like, and this didn't sound like any of them. I got nervous and decided to leave and go get some food and gas in a neighboring town that still had power. About another hour passed and there was still no power. Having convinced myself that the sound was just an animal and that it had probably long since moved on, I went back to the overlook to enjoy my meal. About an hour went by without anything happening, no noise, no nothing, until eventually I saw movement along the big rocks in front of me. It was starting to get dark so I couldn't really make it out perfectly. But at one point, it looked like the head of a disfigured animal peered at me over a rock and then disappeared. It appeared and disappeared several more times, but I stayed because if it was an animal, then there was something. The next morning when I woke up, he informed me that the adults wanted to talk to me. I walked out of the tent and saw people's stuff thrown everywhere. Apparently, the guy, whoever he was, had been going outside each tent and going through the backpacks looking for stuff to steal. One of the adults had an expensive camera missing, 
The adults went and searched for signs that someone else was on this part of the river, but they never found anyone or anything. To date, that is the scariest moment of my life. And though I'm 36 years old, my wife mocks me as I still sleep with a nightlight while prospecting out here in the Caribou region. I came across a set of rock piles known as Chinese piles out in the middle of nowhere. These being here meant someone did a lot of digging back in the old days. So I started working. After around half an hour, I had around 10 grams of gold and was doing a happy dance. That's when I noticed the small standing stones on each of the rock walls. Each stone had several Chinese characters on them. And in a moment of dread, I realized they were graves. I put the gold in a glass bottle I found nearby and left it behind. I also took down drawings of the symbols to show a local historian who later confirmed my suspicions, saying yes, they were graves and likely hadn't been seen in over 150 years. Chinese miners believed that if a miner died on site, the ground became cursed by the fallen miner spirit, so they wouldn't continue to mine the area. They would tell anyone they met that the area was worked out. Sometimes, they would also do extra work to make the site look finished off, so people wouldn't end up digging up their comrades. I've been back several times, but I don't want to dig there out of respect. The site is super creepy. In the morning fog, it's almost like you can see people's outlines sitting around the piles. One of the stories my boss out here told me was when he got involved with some super sketchy folks from Prince George back in the 70s. They went with them looking for some mining gear to steal so they could claim SL. I assume it's a mining claim. Just a few kilometers down the road, my boss went down this forgotten path into a clearing with two ancient bulldozers and a small cabin. The rest went to the bulldozers to see if they ran while my boss went into the cabin and was greeted by a skeleton laying on the bed with a bullet hole in his head. They brought the cops in and figured the guy had been there since 1935, since that was the last date on the newspapers inside. I went to the same cabin with him a few weeks back and found the place had been burnt down by squatters. When I was a theater study student in the Midlands of England, we had to take our little theater company on tour around the local rural countryside as part of the practical side of the course, being a proper London girl. I wasn't best pleased with the prospect of roughing it in a 10-person van, even though there were 15 of us in the company. But for the sake of my art, I stopped being a silly tart and threw myself in with enthusiasm. One day, we broke down in the middle of nowhere. By the time the AA bloke got to us, and in turn, by the time we got to the campsite, all the spaces in the campsite had been taken. We had three performances locally the next day. By 8 p.m., it was almost pitch dark and we didn't have many options left. Our director said it would be best if we drove the van into the nearby forest and all slept in the van for the night. As it was too late to continue driving around and having an early start the following day, we reluctantly agreed. We found a quiet part of the forest that was open with not many trees. And by 9.30, we were settled in the van if a little cramped and cold, we were all 19 and 20 year olds, and it was a big adventure. At around 11.30, I stirred awake by one of my colleagues screaming, and another guy saying, this is bad, we're all screwed. To my complete horror, through my sleep blurred eyes, I saw that our little van was completely surrounded by about 50 men dressed in what appeared to be old-fashioned rural farming clothes, with homemade torches burning brightly. I started panicking but didn't scream. 
I couldn't take my eyes off the men. They weren't moving an inch and didn't have any expression on their faces. Two of the guys even got out of the van to shout at the men. Needless to say, we were all terrified. Every time we tried to move the van, the men moved a step forwards. At 1.30, the men suddenly just turned around and began walking away through the trees. We were absolutely knackered and too tired to drive anywhere else. So we took turns keeping watch in case the strange men came back. But thankfully, they never did. This is my father-in-law's story. He lived in the countryside outside of Punta Arenas in southern Chile as a kid during the 50s and 60s. He told me once that when he was eight years old, around 1964, he was outside playing one afternoon when he saw what he unmistakably described as a flying sorcerer hover over his house. His dad came to check it out, but the sorcerer flew away very fast without making noise and crashed into a nearby hill. His dad started preparing a horse to go check on the crash, but within a few minutes, a bunch of military vehicles showed up and stopped him. Some went to the crash site, while others stayed around to make sure there weren't other witnesses. They weren't rude, but you also got the impression that it wouldn't be a good idea to argue with them. My father-in-law remembers that a lot of them were American, or at least not from the area, because their uniforms were a bit different, and they spoke English. They stayed around half an hour and abruptly left. When my father-in-law later went to check the crash site, he didn't find anything interesting not even a piece of tin. So what exactly was that? For many years, he thought it was an actual alien crash. But years later, he saw a documentary about experimental aircraft and now thinks it was most likely a case of the US testing some new vehicles in the middle of nowhere. You don't get more middle of nowhere than in the Patagonian wilderness. I think that's also the most likely answer, but I can't find any specific sources. If anyone has any ideas or suggestions about stuff I could read into, it would be greatly appreciated. As I'm sure some of you are aware, the hunting season for white-tailed deer is about to start this weekend. I, a 25-year-old female, have been spending a decent chunk of time in this stand with my have been spending more time in a stand after dark than I ever have in my life due to the hogs causing havoc and scaring away the deer from the feeder. We've gone out a handful of times in the last two weeks attempting to catch some miscreants, but so far, no luck. Very frustrating. Anyway, because of the hogs, I've been spending more time in a stand after dark than I ever have in my life. We've been up there from 9 p.m. to 1 a.m., 10 p.m. to 2 a.m., 9 p.m. to 11 p.m., and every other weird time slot you can think of. I mention this just in case it's relevant. The first strange thing happened about a week and a half ago. It was around one or two in the morning with a decent chunk of moon illuminating the area, I was only half paying attention to my surroundings because I'd already written off the night as a bust when all of a sudden I became aware of a weird, whirring SL flapping sound. I thought it originated from somewhere behind us, but my partner said he heard it coming from away into the front left of us. At any rate, it was loud airborne and passed quickly over us and away. I'm very familiar with the sounds drones make, and that wasn't it, but it also wasn't a helicopter or a bird. It sounded too mechanical. It was flying very low, probably just above the tree line, but I couldn't see anything. The second strange thing happened about a week ago. We weren't in the stand, but it was weird and out of the norm 
so I'll mention it. We live on the same property the stand is on. It was around nine or 10 at night when all of a sudden there was a distant boom, like an explosion, which hit our home like a thud. If you've ever spent any time around heavy artillery or explosives, you'll know what I mean. It was strong enough that my sister-in-law, who lives down the road, called us asking what the hell had just happened. It could have been a natural gas explosion. But the weird part is that my partner did some internet digging and a local emergency management website had posted asking for any info on unknown explosions back in 2016 during the same time of year. We still have no idea what it was. Lastly, tonight, we were out in the stand once again. It's gotten cold, and we've had a ton of rain all day, so everything was damp and dripping. We went out at 10 o'clock, and it was around 10.30. I was preoccupied with trying to keep my fingers and toes warm when suddenly I became aware of a weird murmuring. My partner heard it too. He has hearing damage, so I don't think he heard the full breadth of the tones. To me, it kind of sounded like muffled voices off in the distance, like several people having a conversation too far off to make out the individual words. The direction the sounds were coming from doesn't have any buildings or dwellings. It's just woods. There were several different tones. My partner said it sounded like a cow moaning, but not quite. There are cattle in the area, and we hear them vocalizing all the time. This wasn't that, and there isn't any grazing land in the vicinity of the sound's origins. The sounds carried on for maybe 30 seconds, slightly rose in crescendo, and then died off and faded away completely. I want to stress how indistinct these sounds were, if I hadn't been listening intently, I doubt I would have heard it. All of this, coupled with the general gut feeling I have whenever I'm out alone in the dark, has me wondering. I don't necessarily feel endangered, just generally watched and noticed. I have very good instincts, and I try to listen to them. I'd love to know what you all think. There may be a rational explanation for all these phenomena, all I know is I don't want to be another hunter with another creepy story, but I feel like I'm starting to see a bell curve emerge. It was late summer, and I was responding to a night call in a rural area. My partner and I were driving down a winding two-lane highway in the middle of nowhere, with no light of any kind other than the headlights and moon. We were coming up on a sharp turn when I saw a man traveling across the grass from an area of brush. He was moving very quickly and smoothly, as if hauling ass on a bicycle, with no up and down motion like running. Obviously, I was quite confused about a hillbilly on a bike in the middle of the night, but not surprised. He came to a tree and stopped. It was about this time we drove past him. Strange, out the window, I saw a man standing next to the tree with no bike or anything in sight, just standing there, staring at the truck passing by. My hair stood on end. We continued towards the call, and I asked my partner if he'd seen the guy. His response was, man, I thought I was crazy. Hey guys, it's Mort here, and welcome back to Mort's Media. We've officially started up again. I'm really sorry that there was no new content for nearly all of January. Let me elaborate briefly. At the start of January, I released a comp, and I had the intention of making new content. But then what happened is, we had a little family vacation in Ecuador. I don't know if you guys have been following the news, but basically, there were problems in Ecuador. We had four really nice days. And on the fifth day, we were in the historic center, right in front of the equivalent of the parliament building. While we were having an ice cream right in front of it and rounding the corner, we saw all these people running. We're like, what's going on? 
Why are people running? It's not unusual to see people who are just selling their wares illegally on the road get chased away by police. So you know, we thought nothing of it. But then more people came and more people were running and we're like, okay, this is weird now. Then all of a sudden, more police arrived because there were already some police in the area. Then a SWAT team arrives and then the army arrives and we're like, oh, this is getting serious. I don't even know what's going on here. Turns out that the day before, some really dangerous people had escaped from prison and the government had introduced countermeasures against these people. Then there were shots fired, allegedly in the center. One woman came running saying, oh, there was gunfire. So obviously, when people start saying there's gunfire, other people start to panic, namely me. So we ran very, very far, got on a bus, and then were whisked away and made it back to the hotel. But while on the bus, people were saying on the phone that they had to get their children out of school. The president of Ecuador was saying that all the schools are going to be closed until next Monday. And lots of government-run institutions were going to be closed. So, yeah, a lot of stuff happened in a very small amount of time, and it was very, very frightening. Obviously, we didn't sleep very well that night from the fear that the hotel was going to get sacked or something. It was really, really. It sounds like you went through a very unsettling experience in Ecuador. And I'm glad to hear that you and your family made it home safely. Such situations can be extremely frightening and disorienting. It's completely understandable that it took some time to process the events and regain your footing. Thank you for sharing your story and providing an update on your situation. I hope you can find some peace and comfort moving forward. And I look forward to your future content. Stay safe and take care. In conclusion, I'd like to express my sincere gratitude to all of you for sharing your stories, concerns, and experiences. It's been an enlightening and thought-provoking journey. And I'm here to assist and engage whenever you need it. Remember, our world is filled with mysteries and stories waiting to be uncovered. And it's through sharing and connecting that we make sense of it all. Stay safe, stay curious, and until next time, take care.